Remember, we, we started off by looking at the whole series and, and was based on just looking at Johari's window, which recognizes the scotomas, if we can bring that up, or the blind spots in us. For those of you who haven't seen this yet, um, all of us have the arena. If, what everybody else sees of us and what we see of ourselves. What we know and what everybody else knows. But then we also have the facade, what we present to the world, but actually we know that inside of us, there's hidden parts that are known to us, but not to the, to the world. Then there's the blind spot. You know, people look at us and they go, why does he act that way? And we don't even recognize it. Have you, do you know those blind spots? You see it in people. And if you raise it, they go, what? And, and we, it's the, those things of trying to learn, known only to others, but not to you. And that's our scotoma, to use the Greek word, the blind spot. Uh, you know, there's always a blind spot in us, just about here, you know. And then there's the unknown, unknown to you and unknown to others. We're complex beings. Next slide. And the idea of this series was to grow our arena, that we'd get to a place of being WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. And it's been a hard series to preach, I want to tell you. Some of, <laughs> some of the topics have resulted in us wrestling. We're going to have a... Uh, uh, Rachel is busy walking on the Yorkshire Moors uh, at the moment. And, uh, but I felt that I needed to make sure she worked even though she's off. Uh, <laughs> so, so we're going to just see a, a, a video on, on how she found preparing. You heard from John just now. Let's hear from Rachel. If I'm to be honest, I think this series has been one of the hardest topics that I've had to cover in anything that I've ever taught. I think this series has also evolved considerably since we, me and Chris kind of had the idea, which I think was about a year ago. And over the last couple of months, we, me and Chris have spent hours just discussing these topics and, and kind of wrestling with ideas and wrestling with these issues. And I have done so much reading in the topics that I have been talking on, in particular women in the Bible and singleness. I think one of the things that is really important is when you are coming to look at these difficult subjects, is to look at what the Bible says as a whole. It's not to take one or two verses from the Bible and take it completely out of context to suit your beliefs, but to look at the whole picture of what God is saying on a particular subject. For example, what is God saying about women and the role they should be playing? But also understand that the culture that the Bible was written in is a completely different culture to what it is today. So we've got to look at the culture of the time that it was written in and see how much different God, how much different God wants the world to be like. He wants everybody to be treated with respect, with honour, with dignity. And you can see that in the whole of the scriptures. He doesn't place any particular group of people, any particular type of person to be favoured, to be special. He loves and he uses every single person from the smallest to the weakest person to the youngest and to the oldest. He uses every single person. And I think this has also been a challenging series for me. And the reason it is, is I'm going to quote James 1, which I quoted in one of my talks. And I'm going to read from verse 22 and it says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So as I've been preparing for my talks and, and discussing these ideas, I've had to hold that mirror up to myself. I've had to look at what I reflect on other people. And if I'm honest, it's not been pretty. Firstly, I have realised how much healing God has done in me over the years. And that's great. And that's something to be thankful for and something to celebrate. 
but I've also realised how much I've been held back by people's opinion of me as a single woman and how much that stopped me from doing the things that God has called me to do. So I come to this series looking at how much I've changed and how much God has already healed me. But it, he also highlight, highlighted the things that I still need healing for, the things that still aren't of God. For one thing, because of my past, I've realised that some of the behaviours that I dis display in the present are what I use as defence mechanisms to stop me from being hurt, to stop me from being abused, to stop me being used by other people. And so it still affects my relationships with other people. So it has been a challenging series and as I've been doing it, I have been challenged by God. Yeah, it's been a hard series to preach, but as we bring it to conclusion, I want to challenge us all. What's in our hearts? What has this series brought up in our hearts? You know, Luke chapter 6, verses 43 to 45 says, a, tree, a good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from a thorn bush, or grapes <coughs> are not picked from a bramble bush. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from a treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from your heart. You see, in this series, many of us have had to face our own toxicity. You know, uh, we'll look at all the, 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 the list of things that we've, we preached just now. But when we preached on, and I preached on toxic masculinity, and I spoke about my experience in the army, and that kind of thing. And there, there, I had to be honest with myself and say, yes, there is still some of that in me. I still look at people and I judge them uh, according to my criteria and not accept people. And you see, for others, it's very important that we have to be freed from our experiences and the hidden shame that we carry. Because I think that's the big thing, is I could carry shame about that. Looking at, um, uh, at, at this whole purity culture thing, there's shame that's imposed on people. And as Dave was sharing just now, in that day, what's that day that this, that scripture's talking about? in the end times. We live in the end times between the cross and the second coming, or the, at least the resurrection and the second coming. We live in that time, in that day. It was prophesied way before it is covered by the blood of the Lamb. So what have we covered? And you'll see a list up there. Toxic masculinity, purity, purity culture versus the gospel of grace, Submission, and it was submit yourselves one to another, is actually the key verse there. Everybody remember, we had that picture and we showed the Greek language, where actually the word submit is not in verse 22 of chapter 5. You know, everybody quotes chapter 5, 22, wives, submit to your husbands. But the verb is not in that passage. It's borrowed from the verse beforehand, where it says submit yourselves one to another. Um... You know, and we looked at marriage being a priority and a commitment. Raising children that they, they would have self-confidence. Biblical womanhood, singleness, dealing with conflict, uh, conflict and loving yourself. You see, the ch challenge is that in the church, particularly, we become very judgmental and very legalistic in the way we treat one another. And we want to create a community that rejects patriarchy, that rejects that toxic masculinity. You see, we want a community where, 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 for example, women can be free from fear. Fear of being judged. That it be a safe place for women, for children, and for men. That you can come and you do not need to prove anything. You will be accepted and loved as you are. 
Because you know that's what Jesus did for us. Do you know that's the gospel truth? He didn't say to us, oh, first you've got to jump through these hoops and then I'll accept you. Yet while we were still sinners, he died for us. That's the Jesus I know. We want to create a space where equality without fear or control or manipulation happens. Where we submit one to another. You know, in in the Vineyard Movement, we don't use titles. Why? Because we don't believe in this kind of hierarchy where I have the power over you. We treat each other adult to adult. You know, there might be some things in what we've preached over, as, as Rachel said, th- that we've preached over the last, uh, what, four months, that might be wrong. And it's okay for you to come and say, I disagree with that. That's the kind of church we want to be. We submit one to another. Submit one to another. We want to be a church where women in leadership is, is a non-issue. Where singleness and marriage are not statuses. That whether you are single or whether you are married, you are equal. Where judgmentalism is not our currency. You see, as we showed, the purity culture has, became theologically a real problem. Even the writers of the original books have recanted because there was such a heresy going on. We are called to be a grace-filled people because we have received grace. Remember that parable? The the servant goes before the the king and and he says, I don't have the money to pay you. And the king lets him off his debt. He then goes into the street and there's a a friend of his who owes him money and he grabs him and throws him in prison. And what happens to him? The king hears what happened, goes, and he comes under judgment. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, what do we pray? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You know, we, 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 we want to do it this way. We want to use a teaspoon when we're forgiving others. But when we want God to forgive us, we want to go and get a shovel and say, God, here, use the shovel. Yeah? We want to use a different standard. But we are called to be a grace-filled people. Judgmentalism is not our currency. Remember when Jesus was faced, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, with a woman who was caught in adultery. What did he say to her? In verse 10, Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And he said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Note, he doesn't say carry on in your sin. He says go and sin no more. But your sin is forgiven. And he does that for us. That's why that passage from Zephaniah, I say, is in this age. That there's no no shame. Because he forgives us. You see, in the church, we tend to become very judgmental. We look at somebody and say, oh, you know, they... Uh, they dress funny. Therefore, we, 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 we kind of classify them. Do you remember what the Lord said to Samuel uh, when uh, he was choosing the next king? Don't judge by his appearance or heart, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not see the things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. That's the foundation of what we've looked at over the last four months. But what will you do about it? I wanted a glass of water here. 
No, 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 it's fine. I'll, but picture, use your imagination. Chris has a glass of water, but it's it, or, or possibly a cup, so you can't see exactly what's inside it. And it looks like such a nice cup. And what happens is, when the elbow gets bumped, what's inside the cup comes out, and you realize sometimes it's sludge, or sometimes it's pure water. And you see, I think this series has bumped a few elbows. It has for me. It's revealed some stuff that I've got to deal with. And I think for many people, there's, it's revealed stuff. Where did you get the most angry or reactive? I'd then ask, what is God wanting to heal in you? Where is the Holy Spirit saying to you, this is my area? Remember, I want to say to you, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But I do believe the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. He doesn't say, oh, you useless, you, you, you terrible. He says, Chris, I want you to deal with your anger. I want you to deal with that. He's very specific. What has your behavior or reaction revealed to you about yourself? You see, I say this because I want you to know the Jesus that I know, the Jesus that I experience is the one who says, I don't judge you either. Go and sin no more. The Jesus that we have been preaching is the Jesus that says you are better than this. You see, I think Jesus, over this period of time, has been knocking our elbows to reveal what is in our hearts to invite us to a better place. Because if we carry on living with the bitterness and the anger and the toxicity and all of that that is there and not actually look at ourselves and not actually say, this is not of God, guess what? We never come to healing. I think this has been a time of Jesus revealing stuff to bring us to a better place. Do you know he has a better place for every one of us? Every one of us in this room. Oh no, you can't, you can't be meaning me because you know what, what's happened in my family's past or, or my history or what I've done. In Christ, there is no shame. There is no shame. What are you saying about yourself? What is those midnight talks you have with yourself? I see some people laughing because they know what you, you know. If I didn't do that in 1965. Yes, okay, so you weren't born in 1965, so go away. <laughs> These guys are rude to me, you know. <laughs> but the thing is, we self-talk. And we condemn ourselves. And Jesus is saying, I'm calling you to something new. What is he calling us? What is the better he is calling us? He is calling us to the way of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second of this is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, well said teacher. The man replied, you're right in saying God is one and th there's no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. If we can go into the next slide. This is the same passage in the message. The first imp in importance is this, listen Israel, the Lord your God is one, so love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. And here is the second, love others as well as you love yourself. There's no other commandment that ranks with these. Let's just understand the context of this passage. You know, we, we read this out of its context. <coughs> This parable, this passage, is in the context of the parable of the, of the tenant, 
of the tenants. You know, the, the owner of, has built a vineyard. He's rented it out. He sends somebody to go and collect his, his rent. And the people, uh, first of all, whip the person who came. Then they eventually kill his own son. And what is Jesus talking about there? He's talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees about their religious structures. And saying, basically, this vineyard, these people, where you are working, where you are meant to be the people of grace, actually belongs to me. And you have created religious structures. It's reiterated a little in, in the same passage. You know the thing of give to Caesar what does Caesar's give to God? What is God? About taxes. The issue is the coin had the picture of Caesar on. So that's Caesar's. That belongs to Caesar. Give it to him. Whose image are we created in? God's image. Simple. So give to God what is in, holds his image. Give your whole to him. And then this is condensed into this passage. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor and love yourself. You see, love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor and love yourself. There are three things there. The first is we need to fall in love with Jesus. Not to fulfill rules, to wear masks, to be, which is what the, the whole thing of the talents is about, to create a whole religious structure, but to fall in love with Jesus. That, um, uh, can we go back to the message version? You know, I love the way Eugene Peterson has put it, with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. In other words, everything, your whole soul, is to fall in love with Jesus. You know, the, the, the letter to the church in Laodicea in, in Revelation chapter 3, <coughs> you remember the one about you've become lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth? You see, it's a church that thought they were rich. He says, I know your deeds. I, I see your deeds. I think God knows our deeds. You know, 400 kids clothed. But that's not the, the most important. You see, the most important is him. Passion for him. He, say, he says to the church in Laodicea, you, you think you're rich. You know, Laodicea was at the crossroads. It was this wealthy town. And everybody had money. You know, strutted around. He says, but you're actually poor in my sight. He says... You know, Laodicea, they made a fine cloth there. And they, 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 there was this dye that they could uh, make it into this, this lovely color. I think it was purple. And he says, you think you're beautifully clothed, but actually you're naked. They made an eye salve in Laodicea. And so they thought they had good vision. But he says, they are blind. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. You know, we use that verse, which is in this whole thing of the church in Laodicea, where you spew out. He's writing to the church and saying, I'm knocking on the door. We use it as a salvation message to the, to the unbeliever. But actually, think of this. It is the believers who have locked Jesus out of the building. And he's standing at the door. And there's that famous painting it's in St. Paul's. And you look at it, there's no handle on the outside. Will we as the church open the door and fall passionately in love with Jesus again? You see, this is about our identity in him. It's not what you do in the church, but the love we have for him. So, fall in love with Jesus. Fall in love with your neighbor. Both inside and outside of the church. 
Resolve conflict. John's sermon last week. Deal with the conflict that you're facing. Love the people around us. A radical acceptance. You know, one of our five things is to celebrate community. And that's celebrating people from different backgrounds. Our, our vision statement is where anyone can encounter God, become more whole and serve others. That's what we're aiming for. But I don't think we're there. Friends, love your neighbor. You're not competing with each other. I do more in the church or I don't. I do more for the poor or I don't. You know, people are not a project. When we do the feeding on a Thursday and a Tuesday and a Thursday, it's not that people are projects. We want to love them. And I think that's been the beautiful thing about the MK Storehouse, is there's relationships built with the clients. And I'll be standing there, and somebody will come in, and these guys know who they are, and they don't, they're just not like a number. And I commend you guys for that. Love our neighbors. And then the third thing is fall in love with yourself. Forgive yourself. The hardest one, isn't it? <laughs> midnight, midnight movies. Forgive yourself. He has set you free. See your worth. And love yourself. That's not vanity. It's what we're commanded to do. You are worth him dying on the cross. We must have a picture. I'm standing there. The, 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 the Cullinan diamond. You know what the Cullinan diamond is? It's that diamond that was taken, that was found in South Africa, and it's the, the, the big diamond in the front of the crown when, in the coronation. And you know what? It's the biggest diamond in the world. And you, that diamond. There's a, a concluding video that Rachel's got, but I don't think we've re I've gone and I've waffled on a bit too long. So, sorry, Rachel. <laughs> but Rachel basically reiterates this, uh, but she always says things so much better than I do. Um, in, in encouraging us to think of what God is challenging us about. Each of us are going through different things. It's not a one-size-fits-all. We'll send that out in the week as a Thursday thoughts type thing. Watch it. Be challenged. And let us grow. So what is God doing in you? We don't want this series to be, oh, well, now we can take our hard, hard hats off and we're not going to talk about these things again. I think it's like a corkscrew. We keep coming back to the same things again and again as we get deeper and closer and closer to the Lord because he reveals more and more in our hearts. It's a living faith we are called to, not a dead faith. I think it's actually quite exciting. But what's he working in you? And remember, the scripture reminds us, it is him that works the good in us. We don't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. He's inviting us. Come. Come. Amen? I want to say again, the Jesus I know is the Jesus that loves you. The Jesus I know is the Jesus that forgives you. The Jesus I know is the one who says to you, there is no shame. Live in that truth. Let's pray.